So I want to review a little bit what we did last time since that was almost four months ago. Um, we, had, we started having issues with job numbers, um, making sure that the issue was one full of multiple job numbers being assigned to a single job and then having your AutoCAD file spread out amongst all four job numbers. Make sure that when you get a new contract or billable number, your AutoCAD files stay in the original job. And if the new job, if you want to put a shortcut to the old job number, that's a better way of handling it versus having your files spread out amongst multiple job numbers. The other issue is don't create folders on the InDrive, please. Um, in particular, the issue is with the point in our job numbering system. No folder should have a point or a dot in it. Um, we're doing dashes instead. Um, the way CAD Manager and other programs view the dot extension is very detrimental to your files if you have a dot in the file path. So please be sure not to create folders and be if you do for some unknown reason, be sure not to put a dot in the file path. Talked a little bit about some changes in the templates, um, the creation of a separate EXUT C3 drawing template, um, separate from the EXUT, um, just to kind of simplify the layers and the styles and everything that's in those drawings. The whole objective of what we're doing here is to try to make your files as efficient as possible, as streamlined as possible. So that's why you're starting to see some of these C C3 um, designations to kind of um, help with those. We also have the addition of the EXUT drafting layer filter and layers, um, distinguishing line work that's paint mark from record, from as-built drawings and whatnot. We also talked quite a bit about a pothole exhibit. There's now a template that we use for our pothole exhibits. The one thing I want to add this week to that is note that the blocks we use for the pothole symbol, um, those are annotative. So you'll need to add annotative scaling to those if you change the scale of the drawing. By default, the drawing scale is 40. So just keep that in mind when you're preparing that exhibit. We also talked a little bit about um, how to use that pothole exhibit in your design, making sure that you put those blocks in model space, um, you can use points, and then later on you can project those points to your profile to kind of double check um, and make sure you know which utility is potholed versus which you're using as assumed elevations. Um, title blocks and XREFs. Um, be sure that when you draw your title blocks that they're all drawn with the lower left corner at 0, 0, 0. Um, when you bring it in, it should have a 24 by 36 border even though you're, what you're going to be preparing is a 22 by, 20, 22 by 34, make your outer border 24 by 36. Just be standard about that. And also make sure that all your XREFs are located at 000 as well. There was a, like a week where multiple people had XREFs that had kind of been moved in their drawing file. Um, if you, so be careful when you're clicking on entities to move them that you don't accidentally click an XREF. One workaround to kind of prevent that is to lock your XREF layer. Um, it will fade it, fade those things back even further. So a lot of us don't really like that. But if you are moving a lot of stuff in your drawing, you may want to just temporarily lock your XREF layer just to prevent you from accidentally moving those XREFs. There were two new list routines brought up. Uh, the first being viewport, lock all viewports list routine, which can be quite useful. It'll lock all the viewports in your entire drawing. And the other one was a text match, which would um, basically match properties, but you could select which properties you wanted to match between two different text labels. We discussed the survey database. What was that last text match? Uh, so it's a Lisp routine. So it's under um, the Q Drive, Lit, CAD Lib, Lisp 2013, San Diego, and it's called text match. Survey database, we just talked a little bit about how to enter into the survey database, the difference between double clicking on it, which is only going to open it with a read only, versus right clicking, edit database. And we also mentioned there's a way to insert all your import events at one, at one time, rather than having to insert them um, each separately, you can import them all at the same time. We discussed the use of the elevated point marker style. And typically our points do not come in on the elevation assigned to them. The only time to use that elevated point style is when you're drawing, purposely drawing break lines. 
So you'd use that elevated point style, use your O snaps to node, that way you're not entering in the elevation when you're creating break lines and everything else. There were some updated blocks that we discussed, uh, the major ones being uh, with the electrical vaults, there are vaults with the trenches already drawn, like this. So you already have those drawn, so you don't have to kind of manage those. Those are a block, and then you can explode it. Uh, you can explode that to extract the line work separately. And we also um, reviewed the 3315 and the 3316 manholes, um, and the difference between the parkway and the traffic covers. Um, it does come into play. It's about a two-inch offset. So if you're setting this up against your lipid gutter, uh, with, if you're previously we weren't using the traffic graded, so we were actually setting those vaults about two inches off. So be sure to use the correct uh, block, whether it's a parkway or a traffic graded lid. Um, you'll, you can tell the difference here. This one does not have any, this would be a parkway because there's no lid. And then this is the traffic parkway and you can see the dashed outer line. So you can see that's about a two inch offset. So be sure to use the correct one. And then the last block update, or there are two more, was on the distribution. These manholes, let me go down here. These manholes now have a flip command for the little handhole on them. So you can flip that around to either side. And similarly, on this one, you can flip it both directions. So you can adjust that manhole or handhole according to what your plan needs to be. And then there's also a dynamic block in the PRTO for a slope carrot that we can use when we're drawing our slopes. And we closed last time discussing Sheet Set Manager. Um, I'm not going to go over it today. Hope not many people have stayed around for that. So if, you're, if you don't know how to use Sheet Manager, please stay after this, after this and we'll kind of talk about it a little bit. We, bottom line is we need to use Sheet Manager on all of our drawing sets um, and more than just for plotting. We need to use it for all of our sheet numbers and our match line numbers. So we can up, update, have those use fields to automatically update as we make changes to our plans. So if you're not familiar with that, please stick around and we'll just briefly go over it. New stuff. A lot of this is not going to actually be AutoCAD related. Um, a lot of it's just how we manage our data and trying to improve on our processes and make sure we're all on the same page. The first thing I want to talk about is the use of the PDF folder. So the PDF folder, there should be a PDF folder inside any job uh, folder that you're preparing plan sheets for. So this example was a tentative. There's PDF folder. Inside that PDF folder, there should be other folders with the date and a brief description of your PDF. So the reason for this is it gives you a great snapshot of your project, what it looked like at every milestone. And the reason why we put them here as opposed to, let's say, the deliverable folder, who did you send it to on the deliverable? You need to know that. You'd need to know, you know, what, what there's too much to know. So this is a very concise way of snapshotting your project, and you, you can always go back to it and figure out changes, um, et cetera. So this is kind of a good way of keeping track of not only your progress and progression of your project, but also if, if a client says, hey, can you send me a quick PDF? You don't have to hunt, who did I send the last version to? It's right here, right with your AutoCAD file. Tracking changes, this is a great way to do that. It's very difficult to do with AutoCAD files. So let's say even at major milestone, you made a copy of all your AutoCAD drawings. To restore your AutoCAD drawing back to that specific milestone, you'd also have to repath every single XREF to use that archived folder or archived file. So PDF is all, oftentimes much easier and faster to kind of see what, what your project looked like at a certain milestone. So that's PDFs. Archives, um, I've kind of noticed that there's been a quite a wide variety of how we create archived files. This is going to be kind of what I'm going to tell you guys. Do it like this. <laughs> Put your file name and then the date behind it. A lot of people are putting the 
date first and then the file name, and it's just getting all over the place. It's very hard to, quite frankly, see and digest what's going on. Think about it logically. If you're working on a file and you need to go back and restore a previous version from your archive, you wanna, you're going to know the file name. That's your first category that you're going to sort by. So sort this list by your file name. Don't put the date first, put your file name first. So you're just appending your file name with the date that you archive it. Easy enough? AutoCAD templates and styles. Um, as of yesterday, you guys have completely new templates on everything. Uh, they're all up to date on the Q drive. Um, one of the first things you'll notice is the EXTO. There is a regular EXTO and an EXTO C3. For 99% of the time, you guys are probably going to want to use the EXTO C3 file. That's going to include all your points um, or the styles for all your points. So just kind of be aware of that. The EXTO is just pretty plain in terms of just like what we would initially give Inland Arial to develop a file. So just kind of keep that in mind. The PRUT is also separated into PRUT and PRUT C3. I know we don't do a lot of proposed utility work because um, if you're doing the proposed trench layout, you're going to use your PRTL. Um, point management has been cleaned up as well. Um, there's several point codes that will now behave as they should. Um, you guys have previously kind of noticed a lot of checkpoints for survey points, and they'll just come in on your current layer, and that causes an issue when you're trying to freeze all your point data. So the point codes have been revised so that anything with that checkpoint code will come in on its own layer, and you can freeze that. Same thing with fiber optic paint mark. That wasn't previously in there. Uh, there's now a layer for potholes, so any pothole data that we go out and shoot, anything that's pH and then whatever pothole number, they'll come, now come in on the right layer. Along with drain inlet corner, when we shoot that, um, it won't come in with the symbol, it will just come in with the basic point marker. So that's kind of been fixed. The other big change in terms of point management is by default, all your descriptions are gonna come in as raw descriptions now, rather than the full description. So you're going to see the point code that was shot in the field, not the translated, you know, catch basin. It's going to be, you know, CB and then whatever uh, description that they give. So that's going to be uh, more useful for you guys because you're going to see all the survey comments, any depths that were taken. Uh, it's just going to give you a better picture of how the surveyors um, shot the information. Next thing you'll know in the templates, notice in the templates, is all te references to telephone have been switched to telco, because a lot of times we're not really distinguishing between telephone, cable, fiber optics, so we're going to go with the more generic telco, which is how we're going to label things anyway. Pipe network styles have also been updated. We previously had an assumed and a proposed, an assumed and a potholed pipe network style. Um, that style has been expanded. Previously it was just represented in the profile via an open ellipse versus a solid uh, hatched entity. Um, we're going to keep that, but we're going to expand that to plan view as well. What happens in plan view, if it's assumed, it's just going to be a center line. If it's potholed, you're going to see the center line and the walls. So it'll kind of give you a visual cue of whether or not your utility was potholed or assumed. All right, major topic of the day, efficiency. Basically, what we want to do is elevate our game around here. So I'm going to uh, entitle this transferring, transforming our .2 workflows to 2.0 versions. All right, so there's a, right now there's a lot of frustration about the slowness of our computers and the way the files are interacting. Am I correct? Everybody a little bit frustrated on slowness of computers? If you actually look at your computer, the specs are pretty high end. You're talking, what? 16 gigabytes, 24 gigabytes of mem memory. Most of you are at least using a quad core, if not eight cores. So you're all working on pretty high-end machines. So the next thing we have to look at is why are things still slow? To tell you the truth, a lot of it is in how we handle the files. So there's a couple things that I want to go over to kind of optimize your files. So note that all files that are just XREFed into your plan sheets should be very clean. Um, 
probably the biggest offender and the thing that's going to slow you down the most, not saying you're going to gain 0.2 to 2.0, but it's going to cut your file size in about half, is just by correctly managing your the file that we received from our error list. So typically, what happens when we receive a file, let's say, from Inland Aerial, you get this file from either email or TFP. Somebody walk me through some of the steps. What's the first step that you do with that file? Before that, it's not even on our it's not even on our system. All right, let's save that file, put it under receivable, Inland Aerial, the date we receive, right? Step one. Step two, let's copy that file. Where are we going to copy it? Cadmaster. Cadmaster. What are we going to call the file? No. All right. Then what? Did we open that file yet? No. What are we going to do? <laughs> We're going to copy it yet again. We're going to copy that file twice. We're going to call it EXTO and EXTOC3, right? Because we want a basic file that we're going to use as an XREF, as just a background image. And then we're going to use another copy of that file, and it's going to house our um, surface terrain model, our surface 10. All right? So that's kind of the initial steps. Then we can actually open up the files. In the original file, so this is a copy of Inland Aerial's file. And let's say I put it under CAD Master. This computer's having major issues. Copy the file, rename it EXTO, and the first thing you notice is that it was almost very, very difficult to even see what was going on on my screen, right? Most of my screen looked white, right? There was a lot of white uh, entities and objects on my screen. Rather than freeze those layers, we need to remove, delete them from our drawing. This will cut your file size in about half. All right, think about it. Your EXTO per project, let's use a big example, CNF, it's about 130 megabytes. Do you want to pull 130 megabytes into every drawing file that you use? That's a big file, guys. I don't know if you realize, we kind of lose perspective in today's technology of file size, but that's about half of the movie on a pretty high high definition in terms of, you know, like a DivX format, let's say. Um, so that's a lot of data that you're trying to stream over our network, and it's going to slow down your entire project. So if we can easily limit the amount of data that you constantly have to pull down from the network, it's going to be that much faster. So this project is, a, is not nearly as large as some of our projects, so we're not going to see quite the file size change, but we're going to see a significant amount when we talk about cutting it in half. It's still 50% faster. So even though this file is, let's say, 9 megabytes, I'd rather pull a 4 megabyte file than a 9 megabyte file any day of the week. What are some things that you're cutting out? So the things we are cutting out, this grid pattern, right? Do we need that grid? Is that useful to us? No. So let's get rid of all that. Title block, we don't need the title block, right? Don't need that. Don't need their logo. So we're already looking a lot better, a lot more compact. The next thing, since this is our, just our regular EXTO, we're not interested in any 3D objects, right? So what's the first thing that needs to go? 3D lines. 3D lines. EX3DFA, right? That's the layer name. So all these guys get blown out. Just delete them all together. What's the next thing? How about these points? Let's do these points. That's going to be your major major offender on a lot of our projects. This one, it's actually not too bad. There's only 2,600 points. But killing those points will do a lot on your project. This is pretty good. Your file size is probably going to be pretty good. Like I said, this wasn't a huge offender on, on the files, but it, it will kind of get better. The very next thing you need to do, and this goes a long way, and I'll talk about this a little bit too, is having your XREF window open, at least occasionally when you're working on files. There's a, cert, a ma certain, matter, certain amount of data you can glean from your file just by having your XREF window open. The very next thing you need to do on a file that we receive from others, detach 
unfound references. So this, this file here, this image, I think that's Inland Aerial's logo that they use. Obviously, they didn't give us that. It's some JPEG or something. Or worse, it's their ortho photo that they're using. So detach this. If you don't detach this, this XREF is going to come, come in every single time you reference your EXTO as well. So it's going to populate in your list. So detach that. It's not found. It's unreferenced. We're not going to use it. So get rid of it. Clean up your files. Make them streamlined. And then going back to what Rick said, anytime we get a file from an outside source, we need to clean it up by purging, running an audit, and the next thing that kind of doesn't, doesn't get done a whole lot around here, but this will really streamline your project, dash purge and get rid of your reg apps. All right. The only way you can get rid of reg apps is through the dash purge command. So the dash purge command, anytime there's a dash in front of your command, it suppresses the window pop-up. And on the dash purge, you actually get an option that you don't get with your regular purge. And you see it right down here with your reg apps. So you can either click on it or hit R for reg apps. Hit enter through the next one. We're not going to specify a name of the object we want to purge. And be sure to say no to this next one. Verify each name to be purged. If you hit yes, you're going to be entering about a long time. Let me put it that way. I have no idea how many are in this file. 46. That's nothing. Typical project. I bet I could find ones here that have 58,000 reg apps on, their, on the files. And what you'll notice, this goes back to the XREF window. If you start seeing your file size start creeping up, that's an indication that you have reg apps in your project. So how do you get rid of them? I showed you this dash purge, but this dash purge isn't really going to help you much. You definitely want to do it on any file that you receive. But once regapps get introduced into your project, they will infect every file that then references that file. So let's say this one had 48,000 regapps in it, and then I brought XREP this into all my plan and profile sheets. I reference this into all my base files. Any file that touches this, those regapps get put into those drawings. So it multiplies dramatically. Typically, I've seen up to up to about 68,000 reg apps, and that will cut your file size in about half. When that becomes an issue, you start seeing files in the ballpark about 14 megabytes, and when you purge those out, it becomes a 7 megabyte file. So again, if you can cut your file size in half, you're, you're going to be that much more efficient. You're not going to be waiting on your computer. It's not going to be as slow. It's going to be a lot easier to, for you to manage. So how do you get regapps out from your, your, your project? You don't want to open every single file on your project and do the dash purge. So in my next update to you guys, which will be here shortly, I don't remember where I put it. Add-in software. This batch file right here, when we run this, what it's going to do is it's actually going to install a third-party software, and it's going to put put it's going to install it for you and put a uh, shortcut on your desktop. This is basically a RegDAP ID cleanup utility from Autodesk. It's very simple. All you have to do is browse to your job. So let's go that one. And right now, it's actually going to include everything in that job folder. There's only two files. And this is, I'm going to select the folder, and I included subfolders, and I'm going to include XREF files. That's going to basically grab everything in the project. Then you can set a regapp ID threshold. So if it has less than 50, it's not going to do anything with the file. If it has more than 50, it's going to clean them out and then save the file. So that's what this kind of does. So this will actually go through working in the background here, and then it'll process these two files. It'll clean up all the regapps from from the files. So this is a cool utility. I've been using it for about six years now. Um, highly recommended, especially on projects that you know have reg apps. Again, it's very easy to see whether or not your files are infected by going to your plan sheets, doing the dash purge, R for reg apps, see how many are there. If there's 
more than a couple hundred or a couple thousand, I would suggest running this utility on your project. Typically, if you're, if you're in a really large project, I would recommend running this overnight on your way out the door. Set it to run. You'll get the results in the morning. Cool thing about this is it will display the results at the end in an Excel file. It'll tell you the file and then the number of regapps in that file for every file that it runs on. And it'll give you a grand total at the end too. I've seen grand totals up to three million regapps on a project. So you can imagine the amount of efficiency that can be gained by keeping our files nice and clean. And this is definitely one way. So this is why I recommend running it on your way out of the building because if you have any file open for the job, it's not going to clean that file because it's locked on your computer. So you definitely want to close out all the files and then run this um, so that every file is clean because if you, let's say yeah, you leave the EXTO open and your EXTO had 58, the next day when you come in and open your you know, PRTL file, and it references, has an XREF to the EXTO, it then gets brought in, all those reg apps get brought into your file, which then get, gets brought into every file that references it. So it propagates in your project with the click of a button, basically, without you even knowing. Yes, Rick? Uh, just to kind of streamline the process, is there a way to educate our aerialists or locating the files and tell them, you know what, give me two versions, give me the dumbed down version, and then I'll give you the full version? I, I really wouldn't. The one thing that I would say, and kind of looking at CNF a little bit on that file with you, um, ra rather than delete out some of the data, because the issue that we had on that was you can only delete about 20,000, 30,000 points at a time before your computer locks up. The better approach may be to layer isolate the things that you want and just lock them into a new drawing, rather than sit there and deleting the points, I'd recommend let's grab the good stuff and export them out because that, that took about two hours to delete those points at a time. So, but on their process, on their side, is there a way to just get a file that doesn't have all those points? So, we don't have to so we still need those points and we still need those break lines because in our C3 file, we are going to use that data, right? We're going to use those uh, EX, 3D, FA break lines as break lines in our Surface 10. And if we want to add those points, we're going to add it to our surface as well. So I, I don't want to tell Inland Aerial to give us two files because they're going to screw it up. Yeah, just because all we need to do is save the file twice and then edit the one that we don't want the data in. Like I said, let's, add, let's W block the stuff we want out because then we're talking a matter of two minutes versus in CNF that was like two hours. So, yeah, let's definitely um, W block the stuff out. If it's a small aerial, like the one you saw, you saw me deleting the stuff right there. It was a matter of minutes. But on some larger projects, you can't simply just cl click and right-click, select similar, and delete um, because your number of items just becomes too large and your computer freezes. So just kind of keep that in mind. So that we talked about EXTO, uh, be sure to remove the image, delete all the unnecessary stuff. Also in all your other base files, make sure they're pretty streamlined as, as possible. So in your EXUT, let's not have data shortcuts to surface tens. The reason why is because anytime you then reference your EXUT, it's going to rebuild that surface because it sees it. So it actually recreates that entire surface with just by having that as, as an XREF in your planning profile sheets. So that's another reason why we need to really be um, diligent in our use of our C3 files. Your EXT, EXUT is just basic line work, nothing special, just basic line work. Your EXUT C3 file, that's going to have all your pipe networks, right? And your pipe networks need to use that Surface 10. So you're going to have your Surface 10 in that file. There's no need to have your Surface 10 in your EXUT. If you do need to bring in your Surface data for some reason, if you need to check something, you can do that. Just be sure to remove that data shortcut when you're done with your task at hand.
right? So the second objective there is to know your file size as well. And the way you're going to do that is by having your external reference window open and kind of being vigilant on how big is my file, what's the reasonable size for that file. So if I save this file, if it ever lets me, you'll notice that the file size will go down. It'll go from 6.8. This one probably not a huge gain, to tell you the truth. What do you know? Just about half. So you can imagine how big of an impact that is on large projects. You know, let's take a Vine Street. Let's take a CNF. You're pulling 70 megabytes less every time you open a file. That's going to speed up your entire processing. Next thing I want to say about um, your planted profile sheets, if you're simply making changes to paper space and need to switch layout tabs, make sure you unload, unload the PRPF drawing. That's the biggest offender in terms of processing and viewports. Every time you switch layout tab, every single annotation on your profile actually gets redrawn. <laughs> So every line, every line of text, all that gets regenerated just by switching tabs. Even though it's an XREF, it actually goes in and regenerates all that line work. So if you're just doing quick red lines or something that you don't need to see the profile in, unload that XREF. You're talking it'll go about three seconds to switch layout tabs. When with it loaded, you're talking 25, 30 seconds, maybe a minute on some of our larger profiled projects. So keep that in mind if you're doing some simple red lines or just some um, paper space um, corrections to unload your PRPF. You're going to notice a huge change in efficiency and the time that you wait. All right, so that's enough about efficiency. Blocks. There are a couple additions and updates to blocks that I want you guys to be aware of. The first is you guys finally have blocks for existing um, electrical vaults, both plan view and profile view. So if you're tying into existing vaults, you now have blocks developed for them. All the line work is on separate layers, separate colors, and obviously it's dashed as well. So start using these. Let me know how they work. Um, I can almost guarantee we'll probably need to adjust some line type scaling uh, on this line work. Um, it's kind of hard to just do it blind. So as you use them in plan and you plot plan sheets, they go, well, you know, I can't really tell that that's dashed. Uh, let me know so that I can kind of go in there and change them and implement them. So that's the first thing you'll notice. For my civil guys, you'll notice that there's expanded storm drain um, for both existing and proposed, both plan and profile. I won't go over that for everybody, but those blocks are there. So if somebody does, let me know so we can incorporate it. Um, <laughs> our traffic signalization blocks are non-existent, to tell you the truth. So if you find one that you like, please let me know so I can add it and include it. Um, and then we can talk about giving it back to Inland Aerial to use in their files that they give us rather than their kind of generic blocks as well. Typically what I've seen is I've seen uh, designers kind of take one that they like and just copy it and paste it into the EXTO that they're using. So let me give me access to that stuff. And in general, I'm only going to develop things based off of your input. I can't really make things better just, just off the top of my head. I need user feedback. So if you guys tell me, hey, this link type doesn't work, it comes out solid at my scale, I need to know that so that I can go in here and change it so that it works better for you guys. So please give me that feedback. So when we find blocks that we like and you know that they're not incorporated into our CAD build, um, please let me know so we can make it better. Because I, I want to make things better. I hope you guys do too. 
but yeah, traffic, traffic signals, traffic lights, even street lights sometimes, the symbols that they use are pretty shaky. Um, so let me know. There's also things we can do to help with that process. There's a simple list uh, where we can replace all those blocks with our block. Um, it's a list routine. works beautifully. So uh, let me know. A major thing on new blocks is the electrical annotation for the DBLs and etc. By popular request, you are all familiar with these annotation, right? You'll notice that they they might be renamed. They might look a little different. They're better organized now, in my opinion. Um, and then left and right, based off of what direction the uh, leader is going. You now have ones with wipeouts. So now you can place them over, you know, your street hatches and whatnot. So it is a built-in wipeout to each line of text. So that's pretty cool, right? Again, let me know how these go. These have been in kind of limited production for two months or so, and uh, a couple of you have probably used them. Um, I think we've ironed out all, all the little wrinkles, but please let me know. Um, they're, they're working pretty well. So those are available to you, which brings me to kind of the next thing of how do you access them. Due to all the changes, you guys will need to reload your tool palettes. Hopefully you're all using your tool palettes. Yes, everybody using tool, pa tool palettes? So this tool palette window, the shortcut is control three, or you can also find it in your ribbon. So in your ribbon, under your home tab, come on, it's right there. Your tool palettes, shortcut is control three. The one thing bad about tool palettes is they're very hard to push out. There's no way to for me to force an update on them to you. And I just rebuilt them completely. So this is what you guys will need to go do. On your home tab, under this pull, palettes pull down. And then this last icon, edit tool palettes. We'll click that, and this will pop up. <clears throat> and right now, there's only this Imperial Subassemblies list, and it is all-inclusive, right? Wouldn't it be nicer if it was just more applicable to your certain workflow? Well, that's been taken care of. So in this palette group, let's right-click and go Import. Say that one more time, right Import. So now we need to navigate to the new ones. So write this path down. I can also help you with this. It's Q. Civil 3D 2013. ENU. Support, tool palettes, and then palettes. I apologize, it's a long path. It's going to get longer. And underscore exported palette groups. I can also send, send it out to you guys. That'd be helpful. What, you, 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 you guys didn't get that? So there's two to choose from. You've got a civil and you've got a T&D. So if you're doing civil stuff, import the civil one. If you're doing transmission and distribution, do the T&D one. So what that does, so I loaded the civil one. So I'm going to load the T&D one as well. I thought I actually did T&D. So now you'll see that we have all three now. The top one, which is currently being used, Imperial, the T&D, and Civil. And I actually imported that twice. All right, so let's pick the one that we want. So since most people work in the power group, let's do the T&D sub-assemblies. All you got to do is right-click on it and set current. And then this guy will change. 
So now your tool palette is a lot more concise. These are the only tabs that you have available, the applicable tabs. You don't have all the roadway, all the corridor, all the daylight, all those extra tabs. It's more concise to what you guys are doing. And then obviously if you want the civil, the full package, you go to civil sub, sub assemblies, set current, and now we've got everything back. And then, you know, these are all the ones that it includes. So it's more applicable to what you guys are working on. For those uh, couple of people in here working on the gas, I'm actually in the process of building a gas profile for you guys, just so we can get it a little fine, more fine tuned. And we will, we actually have um, a separate tool palette for gas as well. So and it will be again focused on just gas stuff. So it's actually a SoCal Gas um, AutoCAD build that I'm building. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you need it right away, let me know and I can load it on your machine. Um, but it, it's still a work in progress. All right, couple closing comments. Um, dimensions. Don't get in the habit of overriding your dimension text. Your dimension text should read what it is in the real world, right? So I can't tell you the number of times I go into drawings and people uh, overwrite that text. Everything we do here, guys, we're a civil engineering firm. Everything we do should be in real world coordinates, should be to scale. That's what we're representing. So there's no reason why we can't have this dimension use the text that it actually is. I've seen a lot of people come in here and overwrite it. They'll actually select all the text and go 50 feet. It's not a good work procedure. Fix your drafting rather than taking shortcuts, right? This is a shortcut way of making things work for you. However, it doesn't work. Everything we do should be drawn to scale. So rather than force the dimension, why don't you draw the dimension at 50 feet like you're representing? So don't get in the habit of text overriding your dimensions. I don't know what else I can say about that. I see it almost every day here of people overriding dimensions. If you say you want that to say 60 feet and not 60.17, change the dimension style. Don't overwrite your dimension because, all right, let's say you go, okay, well, it, I, I only want it to say 60 feet. Then let's say something changes and this dimension changes. Now you're re representing something completely different and you're still calling it 60 feet. The better way of doing that is change your dimension style, right? So go into your dimension style. We'll use this as an example. You modify it, go to primary units, and change your precision. If you want it rounded to the nearest foot, change your dimension style to the nearest foot. Right? So then we could change this. I forget which one I changed. But that's the way of doing it. Change your dimension style rather than hard set overriding, forcing things on it. Let the software work for you. Don't don't over override stuff. Sure. Sorry. Sorry. Coming through. Coming through. Sorry. This is a seventh inning stretch. Can anybody think of a reason to override a dimension? Oh, how about drawing them to scale? Break line, all right. That that would be a, that would be a valid valid reason, um, where you don't have the space to draw out the long distance. A lot of time we use that in mapping. Um, that would be a valid. I would say that would be valid, where you're trying to represent 
where your dimension isn't actually representing the true dimension. That would be a good, that would be an argument for doing override. But use that in a very limited case, please. Um, be sure that you're using the right type of dimension. There's a couple different dimension commands that you can use uh, depending on what you want. Whether or not it's a lined rotation, a linear dimension, rotated dimension, be sure to use the right command. This does change in 2016. Um, they get rid of all the dimension commands. So use them while you still can. In 16, it will automatically pick the dimension style for you based off of the entity that you're picking. So things completely change. So take advantage of this while you still have the opportunity. Uh, dim aligned versus dim linear. You see the difference? So be sure to use the right dimension that you want. You'll also kind of notice that on some, um, I can't think of a good example right now. If you need, if the text does not go in the orientation that you want, you may need to change your UCS so that it will go the way that you want. Everybody kind of familiar doing that? Have you run into that at all where your dimension text is either upside down or something crazy? Actually, that's not what I wanted to do. But anyway, just just be aware of that, that you just have to change your UCS to a different angle and then redraw your dimension. That's the one bad thing about these dimensions is once you draw them, your text angle is pretty much set at that um, orientation. So you may need to recreate your dimension. The other thing I want to touch on, and let's have this be the last one. Line types. Um, hopefully everybody's pretty comfortable with our line type library that we've built up. I think it's pretty um, inclusive of almost everything we encounter. The one thing that's kind of been lacking is the ability to have the line type or you know the, the letter generate on short lines, right? Right now if we draw a line that's, let's say, 40 feet, And we're at 40 scale typically, right? So, so let's see what we have in, the, in this drawing. We've got all of our line types. So let's say I do a UT continuous gas, right? On a 40 foot line, it doesn't show. My G does not show, right? This line would have to be about 100, 140 feet long before it's going to show. I hope it shows. Yeah, there we go. Good call. So let's redo that. So let's say this line is 40 feet. My line type doesn't show, right? A lot of time your laterals are less than 40 feet and you would want them to have a little G, right? That typically what you guys kind of run into. Like I said, this, this needs to start being almost 80 feet before a G shows up. So let's say we have something that's 40 foot. You now have an option to do that. So it's called a short, short line type. They are not loaded into the templates just because this list is long enough, I think. So if you need to use the short ones, you can load them. They're just not pre-populated in the file. So you go to load, click on the file. Hopefully it goes to this directory automatically. SD line types. And over here. I'm over here. So you'll see these short short underscore ut. Right, so I'm going to go the short gas. And now I'm going to change this guy to 
UT short. I think it's underneath. Or it's short, sorry, short UT. And now the G appears. So that can be a good workaround for some of your laterals that if you absolutely need them to have the line type generation, that's a good method of getting that to show, to use those short. How short does it go before it disappears? Okay, let's still work on legends. So right now that's about 40 feet. So again, that's something we can play with. Um, Jared, does the letter begin at the same size with the other line type? Yes. Yes. So right now at, at 40 scale, your line needs to be about 40 feet still. So that may be too big for you. Maybe you need something more at 20. So we, we can kind of talk about that a little bit. Again, that's something that I need feedback uh, once you guys kind of start using it in production and go, well, you know, as great as that is, it doesn't quite meet my workflow. 20 feet, 30 feet would be a lot better. One scale. Yeah. One scale. So title sheets, what I'm going to tell you to do is just change your LT scale on the line work itself in your properties. Just go up here. But keep in mind when you do this, your size of your text changes, right? So what I what I would tell you to do is draw your legend in model space and then create a viewport. Then all your scaling issues go away. Because you're reading that line as it would appear in your plan sheet, right? At 40 scale. So to me, that that's a far better way of doing it rather than trying to scale everything to from your model space down, down to a one-to-one -one at paper space. It's much easier to just leave it in model space, draw everything as it would appear in your plan, and just create a viewport. That'd be my recommendation. Any questions, guys? Uh, we kind of breeze through a lot of things. I can't stress enough how much I need your feedback on almost everything here. Um, not just the new stuff, but anything that you see, anything that you experience in your workflow, please let me know. I'm not in everybody's workflow, so I, I don't know a lot of the problems that you guys encounter. Um, so, you know, up to two months ago, we didn't even have a structural structures template. So, you know, if you guys give me input, I can try to address some of those issues. So if you're experiencing something uh, that's giving you a heartburn, Please let me know. And also feedback on the stuff that I have already developed for you guys. Um, one thing I will say is Pipe Networks will be kind of revamped in the next week. Um, you, you, they'll be a little bit better for you. Um, most, most of the changes are going to be are going to revolve around the packages. So the telco package, the electrical package, uh, those types of things, they're going to be a little bit easier to use for you guys. So just kind of looking forward that will be here and starting today uh, new things will not be developed in 2016 uh, hopefully this week I will continue to be working on 2016 and finally rolling out profiles for you guys so moving forward everything will be developed in 2016 so any styles that change any blocks that get get developed they're all going to be developed in 2016 so you guys will we will be on 2016 soon and the one thing that you will love is your um, this wonderful tool of Profile Crossing Label, Pipe Labeler. You will no longer need it. Pipe networks now have crossing labels. And they can read the size and material of the pipe network. So you know how on this you have to pick what what's sort through this and pick what, what one you want to use? All that goes away. It will just be one pipe network label, it will label them all, and you can walk away. So those are the exciting things looking ahead. Hopefully I will finish 16 this week, and if you'd like to use it on a pilot project, I'm looking for a pilot project to use the software on to kind of test some of those things, like, you know, that's a new style. So we need to come up and refine that style. I pretty much know what we want it to look like, but I kind of need some... Um, to use it on a project and see how it interacts with you guys. 
but it will dramatically increase your productivity. Um, that right there, that definitely is a 0.2 to 2.0 improvement. Um, you know, that is going to increase your workflow by tenfold easily, easily, hands down. Um, so that's something exciting to look forward to, especially for all the power engineers in here. So again, if you haven't done sheet set, don't know how to do fields, please stick around for like five minutes because that's something we definitely need to all come on board with. Other than that, thank you guys. Yeah, I will definitely email that. All right, show sheet set. So we're going to start a new file here, and we're going to just do two sheets real quick. So the way that you want to build a, you'll have to build a sheet set, but then we also, the way we reference that data is via a field. So it's very easy, you just type field, and then what do we want to use? We want to use current sheet set current sheet number, right? So we'll do that, current sheet number. And obviously you'd have this be 0.1, right? So this would be, you know, down here, that would be your sheet number, right? So right now it's, oh, I'm inside of viewport, jeez. Let's do that again. Sheet number. I'm just going to leave it at text height of one, just to, just for display purposes, right? All right. Then I can copy that entity, put it on sheet two. The better approach would be to fix sheet one like you, how you like it, and then make a copy of that to lay out two, three, four, five. So right now it's this number sign, right? Because what is it reading? It's reading data from the sheet set. We don't have a sheet set, so it's basically a place mark, placeholder. So let's create a sheet set. You can access sheet set by a variety of methods, but you can just type sheet set. So typically what I recommend doing, let me do what I would recommend rather than what I did. So you have sheet one like this, right? So you'll have your title block x ref and you'll have your viewports kind of set up. Then what I do is I'd go copy, create a copy and move to the end. And then this is how I would create sheet two. And then yes, it's in the exact same place because it's an exact copy. And then I'd adjust my viewports to, you know, kind of the next, next sheet. That's how I'd kind of go about laying out my sheets. For your sheet set, up here, we want to create a new sheet set. We want to create it from existing drawings. We want to give it a name. So you'd give it your file name and what you know your, your job number basically and whatever it is. So for me, I'm just going to go lunch and learn 13, right? Most important thing ever is to put, save your sheet set data file in the same path that you have your AutoCAD drawing. All right, so hopefully this is at least on the end drive. I just, this is one of my pet peeves because I've been burnt majorly on it, is somebody at my last company saved the sheet set data on their C drive, which means it's unaccessible to the rest of the company, which means I can't do anything. Once a file is associated with a sheet set, it holds that association. So now I can't create a new sheet set on the project because it's already associated with this one on the C drive. So four hours later, I figure out what the issues are and can move forward. So be sure that you set save your sheet set data where your file is. That is the biggest, biggest thing you can do. So for me, I'm going to put it with my Lunch and Learn stuff. 
So I'm going to put it there. And then you hit browse. This is going to select what drawings do you want to use in the sheet set. So it's only going to let you select a folder, right? So I'm going to select this main folder that all my drawings are in. Yours will be a little bit better than mine because I've got all kinds of stuff here. Yours is going to be pretty specific to the plan set, right? So if you do your CAD power folder, those are your plan and profile sheets, let's say. So I'm going to go in here and uncheck everything that I don't want. So you can do multiple, multiple files. You can do one file. just depends on what you have. For me, I just have this one file. Oh, and I screwed up because I did not save my file. So if you look in here, it just has layout one, right? It's a bummer. That sucks. So I'm going to go back and save my drawing. So after you, after you create your first sheet, you definitely want to sh save your save your sheets. Yes, that that would be a rookie mistake. All right, so launch and learn. You can also add sheets to a sheet that's already created. You can. Um, it's not as good, quite frankly. It, the, when you add them after it's already created, the naming convention is all different. So I I prefer to actually just recreate them rather than add. That's just my personal preference. So browse. Now you'll see that it has my two sheet layouts named sheet one, sheet two. This is another important thing to name your layout tabs in a sensible fashion. I personally like sheet 01, sheet 02. To me it's straightforward. But you don't want to rename your tabs after the fact. It can cause some disconnect. You can also rename them through the sheet set as well. That, that's kind of a good kind of workflow. So there we go. There's our two, two sheets. All I have to do now in my file is do a command that regenerates and the field updates. Fields update every time you do a command that requires a regeneration, be it a save or a regen. So I just regen and you can see that it updated, right? So there's my sheet number. Now let's take it a step further and create M text. So that's just going to be my lower left hand corner, right, for the sheet. You know, now it's going to be, you know, for continuation, see, sheet. And this one will actually go 0.15. So now what I need to do is I need to insert a field inside this M text. Right click. Um, oh, insert field. <laughs> so now what we want it to say is we want to give it the current sheet set plus one, right? Because it's going to be the next sheet. So rather than do current sheet number, what we want to do is actually do a do a formula. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this expression down here, and copy it. And now we're going to go to formula and we're going to insert, oops, copy and paste, and then plus one. Oops. Right? So there we go. So now the cool thing is Let's say your project manager comes to you, right, and goes, hey, you know, I forgot I need to add a sheet of notes at sheet two, right? So we're going to create another new sheet. So let's say this becomes three, right? So sheet three. Oh, I wish this said three now, right? Well, let's add this layout tab to my sheet set. <coughs> so import layout as sheet. Select your drawing. And 
then I did another rookie mistake. I didn't save. Right? So saving is very important anytime you try to add data, be it to a sheet set or data shortcut, you have to save your file. And in general, it's it's nice to save your file. You don't want to lose lose work. That's one of the most frustrating things you can experience, in my opinion. So now sheet three is there. This is what I was talking about earlier. See how it says this layout is already part of a sheet set? If somebody saves to their C drive, you'll get that when you try to add new sheets. So we'll add sheet three. So now when I regen, this data is going to update. Should have updated. I have no idea why I didn't. Oh. See this data here? And that's why I hate adding importing layouts. It doesn't have a number associated with it. So when you right click on this, you can go, all, see this rename and renumber? You want to go through that. So sheet one. Sheet two, this one's blank. Sheet three. So now if I regen, boom, three. And then all these update as well. See how this is now four, and this one still reads three. So, so it's just inserting a field inside M text, and the trick is to then use a formula to edit that field. And when you go back to this guy. Yep. So sometimes you skip sheets, you know, you, it's not the next sheet, it's next four sheets, or it's up and down where you got, you know, you guys work on nice linear projects where it's always plus one, minus one, but sometimes you, you've got match lines on all four of your sheet corners, and this one's like plus seven, this is, you know, or minus seven, plus seven. So you can, you can do whatever you want, it's just a simple formula. So now it says sheet nine. So that formula you want to maintain and then it's going to maintain that formula regardless of how you renumber your sheets. So you can see how helpful this is especially when you're working on an 85 sheet project and you add sheet 2. If you do the quick math you've got over 300 match line that you would normally have to update versus using fields and C for continuation sheet, sheet field. I don't have to do a thing. I just have to add that one sheet to my sheet set and then go through and renumber all my sheets. So there is a little bit of work here. You have to renumber these because when you add sheet two, your previous sheet two still is number two. So you have to re renumber these. But you're talking two minutes versus opening 85 layout tabs, finding all those texts, over 330, you know, changes. So is that the way you want to add the sheet or did you actually, like I was confused about how you wanted to restart the sheet set? So I, I, the reason why I don't like to import the sheet after my sheet set's created is you kind of saw it doesn't, it doesn't assign a number to it. Um, a lot of times I find it easier to remove these and then just re, recreate it. Oh, and then it renumbers them. However, no, the formulas are still in, intact. If your formulas are still intact, um, they're just going to read dashes because there's no data to it, right, when you remove them. Uh, the only issue is sometimes when you create a sheet set, it doesn't create them in the right order. So sometimes you'll have to kind of do, do some of this action of moving them and then going through and renumbering them anyway. So it's hit or miss, to tell you the truth. But yeah, I, it, especially in Civil 3D, you're always better off if you set it up with your ultimate you know, goal in mind, but that's never the case. You, there's always circumstances that change. So yeah, I mean, you try to be as flexible as possible, but the software is meant to be straight linear workflow. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Most of the time it's not. So that's a quick kind of refresh on sheet numbers. You can definitely see the advantage of it. Obviously, when it comes to plotting as well, um, you know, 
I can plot my entire plan set. <coughs> Obviously on this one I'm just using one file, but you can have 20 different files, 10 tabs in each file. Yep? Can you show how to do uh, custom fields? Custom fields. So, so people can actually sort of like stationing or yeah, so, so fields, these are all your options. You can do a whole lot of things with fields. Um, what I really want to focus on is baby steps. Not to skirt the issue, but I want everybody to use fields for sheet numbers and match lines, which is basically sheet, sheet number as well. But you can also do it for plot date. Um, you know, it, it, some managers like to have that date updated every time you print. Others want, want it held. Um, if they want it continually updated, hey, use a field to do the plot date. So it's going to update every time you plot. First, you going in there and remembering to change it. Um, what in particular did you did you did you want, Rick? Like in match lines, sometimes you do a stationing as opposed to a sheet number. Yeah. Um, there's really no field for like stationing. There is. Yeah, you have to control it through the manager. You can do a custom field for it. Um, You can have it read. Let's see. How do you, how do you normally do that? Oh, shh, there it is. Yeah, I think I can do it in the description. I think I can read the description. Yeah, but you can add another field to that. So you, you can you can use whatever you want in here. Oh, go to file, file properties. File? Yeah, file, uh, drawing properties. Yeah. Uh, custom. That's where you add. Oh yeah, uh, you can add stuff here. So you that's why you add. But this is going to be. Um, to to the drawing. Yeah, so, I mean. This, is, this isn't a great way to read the information, but the point of the matter is you can get fields to do whatever you want and to be dynamic and update and to reference them throughout your entire project. So when we start talking fields, the possibilities are truly endless. But I really want everybody to at least do this. Field n sheet numbers and match line. That's a good foundation. I need everybody to be on that foundation before we take it to the next level and, you know, just blow blow the roof off of it. Yeah, dude? Question for you. Um, is it better to do multiple sheets on one drawing or individual drawings and add it up? So that's a tough question to answer. What I'm going to tell you is my personal preference is to put about 10 layout tabs per drawing. Um, you do more than that, you start clogging up your workflows. Depends on a lot of different factors. How many people do you have working on the project? Timeline and schedule. Does it need to be done tomorrow or do you have a week? That's going to impact the number of people that work on it. If you need, if you're really tight and compressed schedule, you may have 10 people working on the project and if you only have three files, that's not going to help you very much. So you may, it needs to be adjustable to your workflow. So if you have five people working on it and they all need to be in the sheets, let's create five files, you know, divide the net total number of sheets between those five files. The reason for it is when you have, let's say, 20 different drawing files, managing XREFs, managing line types, XREF colors, all that stuff becomes that much more complicated. And we want to be as uniform across every plan sheet as possible. There are tools to help you do that, and that's something on my list actually, but I didn't have enough time to it, is layer states, where you can apply one drawing layer states to other drawings, um, but it's still extra steps that you have to go through. So I would say use, use your kind of good judgment, sound engineering judgment, but typically keep, keep your layout tabs to about 10 per file. It's just a little bit easier because 
you're also, the biggest hiccup is open, initially opening files, right? This is a large project. I've got a plan and profile. It may be, take two, two, three minutes to open this file. I'd rather open one file and have 10 layout tabs versus spend 30 minutes opening 10 files. How is the C-Check Manager handling multiple tabs or individual files? The same, the same way. Same way. There's, it, it doesn't really know the difference. It's, 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 it, it has that path in there. So at any point in time, I can come into this file and see exactly what it's reading. It's reading that file name. If I had added a different file, it would just be the next file. Okay. So it, it makes no difference in the sheet set. It keeps track of that information of what Your file it was generated in. So, so correct. So anytime you make a change, do it in your sheet set, and everything updates. The other thing you can do is, um, you know, typically we like to have a, a title on our sheet. You know, whether or not it's title sheet, detail sheet, whatever it is, right? Rather, you could have a field to read that as well, right? So you could call this, you know detail sheet you could add it as a custom property or as a description there's the, there's so many the, the possibilities of what you can do are endless when you talk custom custom fields or anything um, you, you really get the ability to do so many different things um, Jeremy you, you said that when you're breaking up the, the project into a couple different files so that different people can work on can your model sheet Set of those of the entire project, but only have like certain sheets within that project. Kind of like bringing in a trying to think of how to word it. You have like four so, people working on it, but you want every person to be able to see the full scope of the project in that model sheet, but they only have like a certain. So model-wise, your your entire project is always in your model, and then when your division of your plan and profile sheets, it's just the sheets that contain your viewports for that specific area. If that kind of answers, if you get into the workflow, it kind of kind of helps itself. But um, so, for instance, to answer your question here, forget which one I just did. Let's go sheet one, right? So I'm just going to add add the name as the description, and then you know down here in the lower left corner. Come on. Oh, you kidding me? So instead of current sheet number, current sheet description. And also they copied one uh, sheet that was not in the sheet set from the previous project. So that's also in the which sheet set they're linked to yes thank you so that's why you should never copy stuff from other projects you should always start from a template and start fresh yeah I mean this, you you know you can you can see the how much time this would save because you've gone through it um, you've had to renumber sheets you've had to renumber things so that this this information can save you upwards of 12 hours, 16 hours, 20 hours on a project easily, um, and it's and it's stupid, stupid work too. Like sitting there and changing all those match line sheets, it makes you go crazy. And then when you add another sheet a week later and you have to do the exact same thing, you, you start losing it. Hmm. Let me stop recording and I'll I'll, just, I'll share that. But yeah, you you, you it literally makes you go crazy because you're just cad monkey. So, any other questions? If so, I'll be around. I'll be here. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys, for staying around.